Hello, I'm Alex Levin, Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Pediatric Genetics at Flamai Institute and Galisado Children's Hospital in the University of Rochester. Thank you very much for having me today. I'm very glad to be speaking to you. Sorry that I can't be there in person. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, clinical trials for retinal gene therapy. Uh, the retina being the main target that we'd like to approach for children with paroxysomal disorders. It was not too long ago that we were the first to describe uh, PEX1 and PEX6 genes that caused a paroxysomal disorder called Heimler syndrome, which some of you may be familiar. Uh, and the question is, how do we take this information? Uh, how can we lead this to a treatment for you or your child? Well, why do we even bother finding genes? Uh, a gene, knowing your gene for your disease, gives us a diagnosis. Uh, and also allows us to counsel appropriately. What's the risk of it happening again? How did it happen? What's the future hold? But knowing a gene also gives us the cause, the etiology of a disorder, and that we hope would lead to a cure. So what is gene therapy? Well, genes live in DNA. DNA uh, is the chemical in all of our cells of our body, which are the blueprint. They tell you how to build a person as opposed to how to build a house. And they make the materials to do that. And on DNA are strings of genes. And each gene you might think of as a railroad car uh, with this one carrying the lumber and this one carrying bricks and this one carrying windows and so forth. In the case of the human body, these would be carrying different products that are used in the building blocks and the mechanisms to make a human being or an eyeball. Genes themselves, each gene makes different material, just like each container on that train carries a different material. And those materials are called proteins. And proteins come in three different kinds. One form of protein are the chemicals or enzymes which make reactions happen. You might think of them as the workmen building the house, right? They're the guys that are hammering the nails and plastering the walls. And then there's the building blocks such as the membrane that, can, that a peroxisome is made up for. You might think of that as the lumber and the bricks. And then there's the orchestra conductors. Those are the foremen on the job, the people that are telling other genes what to do and where to hammer and where to put this and so on and so forth. Those are the three basic kinds of proteins, what they do in making a human or making an eyeball as opposed to a house. Now, peroxisomes are really complicated. They have lots of things that they have to do. They have a membrane, and all of these parts and people and enzymes have to be made to make a peroxisome. And therefore, there are many genes involved, and each of these genes has its own role in uh, peroxisomal structure and peroxisomal function. The idea of gene therapy would be if one of the genes, one of that box cars fails to be delivered uh, and can't make its protein, we might replace the protein that that gene is supposed to make. We may up or down regulate a gene to make a good gene work harder or to make a bad gene work less. We might re actually replace the gene or the gene function using gene manipulation. We could even think about fixing the gene in situ. So in making a house, replacing the protein would be getting new lumber. Up or down regulating the gene would be like taking a bad worker and making them take more lunch breaks and taking a good worker and making them work harder. And replacing a gene or gene function might be giving alternate lumber to build the house using cedar instead of pine. Or actually fixing the gene would be to get a better mortar, fix a better mortar, or maybe fix another worker, get that worker to work harder. Now, the eye is a very good place for gene therapy. It has a special immune privilege. There's natural barriers that prevent what's happening in the eye from being recognized by the, the rest of the body or spreading to the rest of the body. So it's a very localized and protected organelle. We can get to the eye very easily, as you'll see, and we can actually see what we're doing. When we do gene therapy in the heart, you can't see the heart. Or in the liver, you can't see the liver. But in the eyeball, we got to do a look inside like you do on a regular eye exam, and we can see things happening. The eye is like a camera. 
Uh, it has a system in the front that serves as the lens, the focusing part of the eye. And then the inner lining or the wallpaper in the back of the eye is the retina. And it's the retina that's getting degenerated in many paroxysomal disorders. And we can see in through the pupil just like you see out and actually see gene therapy at work, just like we can see the degeneration of the retina happen. If we want to look at a retina, imagine splitting an eyeball in half, throwing away the front part, and looking into this back dome of the retina and taking a picture. And we would see what looks like this in two dimensions, since it's a picture, a flat picture. We have the optic nerve. The brain is behind the scene. The optic nerve plugs into the eye right here. It brings with it the blood vessels on the inside of the eye, the inner lining. There's a special spot. This is a right eye closer to the ear, the special spot for focusing and seeing called the fovea. And that's, we can see this very easily. Another way of looking at this is here's the eye nerve, the optic nerve coming from the brain into the eye. The same picture that we took of this, we have the retina. We have the white of the eye called the sclera, and in between is a vascular layer called the choroid. And we can use knowledge of this anatomy to give gene therapy. Well, how would you do it? Well, if you just need the protein, maybe you swallow a pill that replaces the protein. Uh, you'd have to figure out a way that that pill would just work in the eye and not work elsewhere in the body. Maybe eye drops. You could deliver gene therapy, and there has been gene therapy delivered for other conditions through eye drops. But for the retina, those eye drops aren't going to get all the way into the inside of the eye very well. So we would inject the protein or the gene under the retina or into the eyeball to get to the retina where it does its work. And we would use viruses, or we call them vectors, viruses to go in and deliver the product. Now you're familiar with viruses. Um, here's how we could put them in the eye. We could inject it into the jelly of the eye. This long needle might inject it underneath the retina of the eye in other ways as well. The familiarity you have with viruses is through the common cold. The common cold is a virus. It gets into your nose. It infects the cells of your nose, causes them to be sick because the product it's delivering is its own virus product that takes over those cells. And as it runs its course, it makes you have a runny nose, so on and so forth. That virus is called the adenovirus that causes the common cold. But what if we took this adenovirus, took out all its guts, so it can't cause the common cold, it can't cause disease, and instead put in peroxisomal gene, the gene that we wanted, PEX1 or PEX6 or whatever, put it in there and therefore use this as our vector as our virus, as our delivery channel, our delivery man that's going to go into the eye and infect retinal cells instead and deliver its product now being the good gene or the mechanism to fix the bad gene into the retinal cells. So here's our diagram. If we injected a needle underneath the retina, the green stuff is the bunch of viruses in a liquid that would raise up the retina they would infect this virus into the cells of the retina and create a fix for the problem. Here's another way to look at it. Here's an eyeball, the retina inside, but the retina is very complicated. It's got layers of cells. And if we look at it this way, we're going to turn it in this direction so it's looking up. And we're going to put this block right over the macula, right over that fovea. And we're going to use a, a technique a uh, very commonly available tool called OCT to look at the retina. And we can see that piece, this is just a camera, you put your chin on a machine. Many of you have had this, or <coughs> your children have had this. And we can see all the layers of the retina. And this black and this white line, that's the cones and rods of the retina. That's where the sickness occurs. And if we could deliver the needle underneath this retina, then we could infect these cells to deliver treatment. And here it is in real life from another center. You can see here's a needle. It's going under the retina. And here's that same OCT in color. You see the, the fluid is in this black space here, infecting the cells of the retina. Well, is this science fiction? Nope, it's not. It's happening right here. 
And in 2018, the FDA approved the first gene therapy for the eye. It was for another disorder, not a paroxysomal disorder, with a gene called RP65 for kids over one year of age. Now, I can't show you a video on this format where I'm recording in advance, but just imagine we take this child and we're going to cover one eye, the eye that is not going to be treated, so he's viewing only with the eye that's going to be treated. In this disease, the children are born virtually blind. He can barely see a hand waving in front of his face. And this is before treatment, and I was going to show you the video of him walking, but he gets on here, and right around square two, he just can't find his way. He wanders off the course, and a gentleman comes in, and redirects him, and he wanders off the course again. He just can't do it. And just a few weeks after treatment, the very same kid using the very same eye will get on this machine, this obstacle course, and he will follow the arrows, boom, 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 boom. He'll step over the step. He'll go over the next step. He'll duck down under this obstacle and come right out the door. It is incredible. This kid went on from being blind to being able to play baseball, ride a bike, goes to a normal school. That is incredible. It's amazing. But is this success? It's for only one gene, RP65. It took 20 years to develop. There's maybe 250 to 500 eligible people in the United States. It's not treating many people. It only works on some of those people. On adults, it doesn't seem to work as well. There's only 14 centers in the United States that are allowed to give this treatment. We are one of them here in Rochester. And it costs $425,000 per eye, $850,000 per patient. That is not a viable treatment. It's great. It's helping patients right now. We're delivering treatment. The other 13 centers are delivering treatment. And many patients have had life-altering effects from this. But we got a long way to go to generalize this to other genes. And in fact, there are many other trials going on for many different genes some of which are showing more success than others, but they're going on. That's what's important. They're happening now. Gene-specific therapy requirements, you have to know your gene, know your genotype. It has to be confirmed that the test is correct. They're not correct. They're not always correct. And there has to be cells present in the retina to be infected. Here we can see a patient with, like that boy, and he had all of those cells where they are waiting to be Effective because in this disease, the cells are there, they're just not working. But in other diseases, that's not the case. This is what the retina looks like in PEX1 and PEX6. You can see there's all these cysts in the retina. It's a sick retina. And the question is, would gene therapy get in there and help? Well, we can see down here there are still cells that are waiting to be treated. And that leaves some questions about what would the effect be in the disorder. Maybe we would get the gene by just injecting into the eye, a very common procedure called intravitreal. We don't have to go under the retina, a more complicated procedure, to treat those cells that have cysts in it as well. But it's going to be a bit more of a challenge. What are our expectations? At the very least, we would hope gene therapy would stop progression. Would it restore function? The RP65 restores vision in the dark more than it does vision in the light. It's hard to know. You would need to have the inner retina, the retina to which the cones and rods connect still has to be working. Will it restore vision? Well, it depends on degree. If you're only able to see a hand, then getting to see a letter on a chart, a big, even a big letter, that's big news. But if you're able to drive, getting to 2040, from 2040 to 2030, what, that's less of an improvement. So it depends on what your vision is to start, the degree of improvement we would expect. In paroxysmal disease, you often lose your side vision. And if you're losing your side vision, that's going to be harder to get back because we can't treat the side vision of your retina. It's the center vision that gene therapy be more after. And many of you have had ERG tests. Well, we don't really care if we make your test better. We care if we make your vision better. And what if there's no cells to even infect? What if the cells have died? Well, we have two options then. We could do what's called gene agnostic therapy, where it would be gene therapy that doesn't depend on knowing your gene. 
So it would prevent the further degeneration. For instance, there's something called rod-derived cone viability factor. When your rods die, they have a chemical that they were making that keeps the cones, your center vision cells working. What if we just supplied that protein to keep the cones alive, even though the rods, which are peripheral and night vision are dying, at least your center vision will be okay. We're looking at a trial of antabuse, the drug that is actually used to treat alcoholism may have a role in keeping the eye from dying due to miswiring that occurs as it's dying. Or there's optogenetics where we would take cells of the retina that aren't dying, but usually don't see light and turn them into vision seeing, seeing cells. Another thing would be to give you new cells. If the cells are dead, we could take a little tiny biopsy from your skin, convert cells in the skin called fibroblasts to stem cells, convert those stem cells, your own stem cells, into photoreceptors, into rods or cones. We could use CRISPR to correct the gene defect and give them back to you. We would give them back using a robot that grows your cells and then picks them one or two at a time and puts them into these wells in this 3D printed microscopic grid that we would slip under your retina to deliver 500 or a million cells right here in the middle. And they would regrow and restore vision. Well, this is all interesting and exciting, right? It sounds pretty darn good, but you want to know, does it apply to me? Will it ever apply to me? And what can I do to get gene therapy? There are no trials or treatments right now currently available for gene therapy in paroxysmal disorders. Why is that? It's hard. It requires a thorough understanding of the disease, which we are getting. You have to have a way of following patients. We have to know what tests that we have will be a marker for monitoring a patient during the disease process or during the treatment process. You have to make sure it's safe. That takes time. There's this thing called the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, that regulates all this and has phases. It only lets a certain number of patients go through. You have to go through a safety phase, and, and then you go through a dosing phase, and each phase takes time. Usually, patients with poor vision get treated first because it's safer, they have less to lose. Each phase has its observation period, usually of several years. The FDA would only allow a certain number of patients, maybe a small number, to start. And there's certain things that would get you in a trial, Maybe your vision, if your vision is too good, it may not be worth the risk at the beginning. Certain things will get you out of a trial. Let's say you're health, unhealthy or have an immune disorder or something else that might prevent you not to be involved in research. It takes time. How do you know when a study is available that you can take a look at? Well, you can go to this website, clinicaltrials.gov. If you went right now and put in peroxisome, 44 different trials would turn up. If you then used a filter to say which are enrolling, right now looking for patients with the eye, you'd only get one. So how do you find out what's really going on? And not everything on clinicaltrials.gov is good. Some of those trials are very bad that you wouldn't want to be involved with. You need to know someone in the know. Well, GFPD, your organization is a great place to be in the know. Another place is to use an eye geneticist, a specialized ophthalmologist who treats genetic disorders of the eye, like Dr. Kunikuk from Montreal and myself. There's very few of us, though. There's only 70 or 80 of us in the world, but we're out there and we're here to help. What can you do now? Keep in touch. That's important. Keep your finger on the pulse. Make sure your gene testing has been done and you have an accurate diagnosis. Don't smoke, and if you're too young to smoke, stay away from secondhand smoke. That's bad for your retina. Vitamin and diet changes don't do much. You'll read about vitamin A to treat retinal disorders. That has no applicability to paroxysmal disorders, and in fact, might even make you worse. So you can eat a regular diet, well-balanced diet. You can have a multivitamin, even if it contains vitamin A, but don't go to the store like you'll see on Google and buy extra vitamin A. DHA, 
is good. That means eating fish three or four times a week or two or three times a week is very good for your retina. And wearing sunglasses is good to protect from the rays of the sun. Read this book, Ricky Lewis's book, The Forever Fix. It's about what families do to make gene therapy happen. It's a really great work on the power of parents. And I would encourage you to be advocates for yourselves and for your children, uh, to help work with researchers to get things moving. And in particular, it costs money. It costs money to do gene therapy, millions of dollars. And raising those funds in a sustainable, meaningful way helps myself, Dr. Kunaku, but other researchers around the world to bring gene therapy. Will there be a treatment for the vision in proxomal disorders? Absolutely. In fact, you're well on the road. You have interested doctors and researchers like myself and Dr. Kunakup and his group here, Dr. Braverman, people who are really working on this right now to bring this to you. They've done it in mouse, mice, and most of these start, trials start in animals. The natural history study that Montreal is developing is a way of over five years, what, how does this disease progress? What are the best tests, the best markers, OCT and other tests, to help us know that we're, we're following the right thing to know if patients are getting better when we respond to treatment? There will be treatment in your lifetime. It's no longer an if. It's now just a when. What will it look like of the things that I showed you today? Will it stop the progression or will it be a cure? We don't know. But we are well on the way to bringing treatment to you. Keep in touch. Keep checking. Make sure you're aligned with a good ocular geneticist. Make sure your tests are correct and accurate. But I can tell you, there will be a treatment in your lifetime. It is going to happen. And it's going to probably happen, I would think, within single-digit years, maybe 10, 10, 15 years, there will be gene therapy for many of the retinal degenerations and you will have the benefit of this as well. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, alex underscore levin at urmc.rochester.edu.